Okay, well, it looks like we've got quite a few people in here now, so um, I think it's good to get started. Welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> let me know in the chat if you can't hear me or anything like that. But we're going to get started here with just a little bit of housekeeping on the water talks. Uh, feel free to share your screen if you want to. Just know that this is being recorded uh, for viewing at a later time on our website. Um, you don't have to share your screen, obviously, but you're more than welcome to. A couple other quick housekeeping things. Um, everybody is muted and you can ask questions in the chat and I will um, ask questions for you at the end of the talk. Um, we're keeping everyone muted just to keep it a little more organized, but feel free to ask questions in the chat and I will um, present them to Amanda at the end of the um, at the end of her presentation. Um, so feel free to let me know if you can hear me. I can't see anybody obviously, so um, you can say it in the chat or give me a, a thumbs up or something like that. Otherwise, I will just get started. Patty, I see a thumbs up, so that's good. I'm guessing everyone else can hear as well. Okay, uh, hello and welcome everyone and welcome to the um, Acton Wakefield Watersheds Alliance first water talk, uh, in, um, first in our series for the spring of 2021. For those of you that don't know, my name is John Balanoff. I'm the executive director of AWA. Um, AWA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to um, Sorry about that. Dedicated to protecting and restoring water quality in the lakes, rivers, and streams of Wakefield, New Hampshire, and Acton, Maine, uh, in an effort to preserve local natural resources as well as larger coastal watersheds that they feed into. Uh, we have many important water quality programs that incorporate local, state, and federal partners, and our Water Talk series is just one of these. Um, the goal with the Water Talks is to try to bring engaging and interesting information to our community. That's relevant to the lakes that we enjoy, as well as the ecosystems and communities that support them. We typically host about four water talks in the spring to kind of get people thinking about water quality and lake ecology before the busy season starts. Um, so with that brief introduction, I'm going to switch gears and introduce our guest for tonight's water talk. Um, Amanda McQuaid is from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. She's our speaker tonight. Uh, she's a University of New Hampshire alum, just like myself, and she has degrees in freshwater and marine biology, as well as a master's in zoology and a PhD in biological sciences. Uh, Amanda is currently the program coordinator for the newly developed Harmful Algal and Cyanobacterial Bloom Program at New Hampshire DES. She also oversees the DES Beach Inspection Program. Uh, these programs focus on monitoring New Hampshire water bodies, for potential pathogens and toxic cyanobacteria to protect public health. Uh, tonight, Amanda will be speaking about cyanobacteria blooms and their increased presence in New Hampshire. We'll talk about the implications of cyanobacteria advisories that are put out by NHDES, as well as some of the different species of cyanobacteria that you find in the lakes of New Hampshire and the toxins that can be associated with them. I will also discuss the importance of conducting cyanobacteria monitoring on your lake. Um, so with that brief overview and that housekeeping, I'll pass it off to Amanda and let her take it from here. So everyone, please welcome Amanda McQuaid from NHDES. And Amanda, you can share your screen whenever you're ready. And uh, feel free to unmute yourself as well. Oh, can't unmute yourself. All right, sorry about that. Um, that would be a problem. Let's see if I can fix that. Um, Got it. All right, thank you. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And see my screen. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you um, for hosting me. I'm really excited to um, present a little thing I know about cyanobacteria or more, um, but I also wanted to leave this open for questions at the end, so I hope that we have a good discussion at the end. Um, again, 
My name is Amanda McQuaid. I'm with New Hampshire DES, and we have just launched a new um, program around cyanobacteria blooms. Um, just getting, you know, getting started. It, it's this um, cyanobacteria monitoring has been part of the BEACH program, but we are seeing a growing need for monitoring cyanobacteria. And um, so hopefully that will be what this program is. Um, my contact information is here and I also have that at the end. Um, so just to start, just to kind of orient ourselves on what, like where cyanobacteria really come from, what they are, um, you know, plankton is loosely defined as microscopic organisms that are drifting or floating in the sea or fresh water. But when you really like dive into the water, if you really would to put a plankton net down through a water column, you'd find lots of different things, not just um, cyanobacteria, uh, but lots of different types of organisms, plants, animals, bacteria, a lot of really interesting things. And so it's always good to like kind of remind yourself that these things are very naturally occurring and there's a lot of different types of phytoplankton that are just there. Um, phytoplankton are microscopic plants, photosynthetic bacteria, but it encompasses a lot of different types of organisms. And um, the main groups, I guess, that you could say that we often see um, represented here are diatoms. They're kind of like this glass structure. There's a lot of different types. Um, golden browns, which just as they sound, are golden brown in color. Sometimes creates sort of a fishy smell to the water or, or a brown hue to the water. Um, dianoflagellates are very common. They have flagella. They have sort of a hard um, surface to them. Um, there's green algae or the chlorophyta, and there's just a huge, huge diverse group of green algae out there. Cyanobacteria, of course, which we'll talk a lot about today. Um, euglenoids, which are kind of like this plant animal type of mixture. Um, we sometimes see those. And yellow greens. So there's just so, so many different types of phytoplankton and cyanobacteria are just a natural part of this um, assemblage. And so you've probably heard a lot about eutrophication, um, or if you haven't, let me just explain a little bit, but lakes are classified based on several factors and all lakes are sort of going through a process called eutrophication, meaning that they started off like a glacier lake and they're just kind of growing and growing with more nutrients and organisms. Um, so phytoplankton is actually a big, part of the classification of lakes. And so you might have heard of like eutrophic, mesotrophic, oligotrophic. Um, we even have lakes that are ultra oligotrophic or hyper eutrophic. And this is just a way to sort of like classify how much chlorophyll we're seeing, how many phytoplankton um, correspondingly we're seeing, um, the water clarity, nutrients. So there's a lot of different parameters that go into eutrophication. Uh, classification. Um, but what we're finding is that um, with eutrophication and climate change, we're just seeing more and more of the cyanobacteria. And again, several factors go into um, the reason that they grow. Um, sometimes they're just quick little blooms because of a nice, you know, uh, warm day after some rain. Sometimes they're more habitual because of um, things that have happened in the watershed. Um, but researchers are finding that we're going to find more cyanobacteria blooms with increased temperature. Um, lakes that are um, severely stratified, especially limited by oxygen at the bottom of the lakes. Um, pH might be a factor. Rainfall certainly seems to be a factor. Um, storm events and, and the more extreme weather events that we experience, um, but mainly uh, nutrients. And so nutrients play a huge role into this classification of lakes and what supports cyanobacteria growth. Um, we largely blame phosphorus for cyanobacteria blooms, but there are several other nutrients that help support their growth. Um, 
Iron is very important. There's a lot of micronutrients. Um, nitrogen can be important as well. Sometimes the ratio of nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus can support certain types of cyanobacteria blooms. Um, so there's never just one thing that causes um, cyanobacteria blooms. There's lots of things. And so while it's very natural to have cyanobacteria in the lakes, we're finding that lakes that are more vulnerable to eutrophication are likely going to see more cyanobacteria blooms. And cyanobacteria are formerly known as blue-green algae, but what we know now is that they're really photosynthetic bacteria. Um, they've been on the planet for as long as we've been here, um, three and a half billion years. Um, they've actually been attributed to helping create green algae, plants, and oxygen on the planet. There's thousands of species and probably hundreds or more of toxins. We're learning about toxicity of cyanobacteria more and more all the time. And what's really interesting about them is that they're not just found in lakes. They are ubiquitous um, in the environment, but also globally. I mean, they are a group of organisms that live everywhere. They're in the air, they're on the trees, they're in the soil. Um, they're really everywhere. And there's really no location on the planet that you would not find cyanobacteria. And so I think the main reason why, we, why we're concerned, why we want to monitor is because some can be toxic. And this does not even cover all of the toxins, but the main thing is that they're toxic in several different ways. There's some that are more uh, liver targeting, like the microcystins. There's some that are more nerve system acting, like the anatoxins. Um, a lot of the symptoms that they share are that they're neurotoxic. And there's acute toxicity, and there's also chronic toxicity. And there's a lot of conflicting results across the world on toxicity and who produces it and how often and when. And I think in New Hampshire, one of the big reasons that we're mostly concerned, we do not get a lot of you know, health reports or illness reports of somebody being ill after swimming at the lake. Um, we, we do get some calls about dogs. And, you know, if you think about it, there's a lot of dogs that like to go in and drink the water, you know, drink a lot of water. And then they might have scum on their fur and then they groom themselves. So dogs are highly susceptible to the ingestion of toxic cyanobacteria. And actually, you know, a lot of cases have shown that dogs will, you know, make it, but sometimes dogs do die acutely from the exposure to HAPS. Um, this paper by um, Backer et al. with the CDC did show that many of the canine intoxications were associated with HABs, and many of them, or most of them, were with freshwater HABs. And so we're, we're not, you know, just worried about toxicity. Sometimes these blooms create lots of different problems. I mean, aesthetically displeasing. You know, people like Cleary Lakes, they don't want green, scummy lakes. Um, these blooms can also just create lots of different changes in the oxygen in the water. So then you might find dead fish. Um, you might find an odor to the water. You might find just scums and dead fish along the beach that you want to swim at. And so there's more than just toxicity associated with blooms. Cyanobacteria may produce toxins. These are called cyanotoxins. There's a wide range of toxicity that can occur. They can mildly cause skin irritations. Um, more commonly, it cause symptoms associated with gastroenteritis. Some of the more acute issues that we've seen with dogs are seizures. Um, and then there's a lot of studies that uh, show a chronic illness um, and in some cases, even death from cyanotoxin ingestion. But not all cyanobacteria are toxic. And I just 
show these four images here. These are four of the most common cyanobacteria that we see in New Hampshire. Uh, the top left there is Delichospermum, uh, also known as Anabina or formerly known as Anabina. And that's probably the most common one we see. Uh, the top right is Aphanizominin. Um, that one can produce saxitoxins and anatoxins and also microcystins, so has been known to produce a lot of different ones. Um, the bottom left there is Oscillatoria, or in this case, um, Planktothrix, and that's very common. This type we find deeper in the water column, sometimes seven meters down and it's blooming, you know, and it might stay there or it might come to the surface. And then the bottom right, which is not the best photo, but that's sort of um, a glob of microcystis. Microcystis has been um, attributed to higher toxicity in blooms. But we see just so many different types of blooms. And I'm talking about not only surface blooms, but you know, the benthic scums that might surface um, these strange like blue green marbles that sometimes are found in the lakes. There's a wide variety. Um, if I stop from, you know, start from the top left here, the, the blue green scum, that's very typical. That's like what you expect of a bloom, but we've also seen um, this yellow orange type of bloom um, persisting for quite a while. And this last summer found that it also created this orange blob that you see on the top right corner. Um, so this was a mixture of cyanobacteria and um, a green alga called Botryococcus. And so combined the Warnachinia cyanobacteria and the Botryococcus in that microscopic image at the top there made up this orange blob and also kind of created like this orange color to the bloom. Um, moving down, you know, sometimes just the water, the whole lake kind of just looks a little green, but not very clear as maybe it usually is. Um, that can also represent a bloom. Again, those nostoc or those blue-green balls, that the center photo there, that um, does not create a surface scum and actually looks really pretty in the water, but these um, contain lots of little coiled organisms or cells rather that are um, potentially neurotoxic. Um, we have the bottom right there, that black sludge that um, you see there, that is actually a benthic mat of cyanobacteria that surfaced and then sort of beached itself. Um, we also have picocyanobacteria, which is that black and red dot photo there. We have to shine lights on it to even see it. Um, to enumerate it and to see it under a microscope, but it can make the water look a bit green and could be toxic. Um, this bottom middle photo here is blue green flecks. Sometimes we say, oh, you might find blue green flecks. Um, that is sometimes the oscillatoria or the planktothrix from deeper below in the water that come up and they kind of bundle together. And if you can see these little clumps, you're already looking at millions of cells there. They represent a very highly dense package of cyanobacteria. And then finally, that bottom left corner, that white cloud, we've gotten calls about detergent in the water and it turns out it's just a bloom that is dying. And um, blooms that are dying are often very toxic also. Um, some really interesting different types of blooms that we see in our cleanest lakes. Um, Gliotrichia is a cyanobacterium that you would see and it looks just like a bunch of little dots in the water. Um, we see this in a few, like Lake Winnipesaukee, Lake Sunapee, we see this um, pretty often. And they kind of look like little fuzzy balls in the water. And as you get closer um, under the microscope, you can see that it's made of these filaments of cells and at the center has um, actual specialized cells for its growth. Nostark again here. Um, we find these, we found them in Patekaway, Millen Pond recently. Um, inside these balls, again, you could like hold them in your hand like little marbles, but if you were to cut them open and look at them under the microscope, you'd find all these little kinked coiled cells. And these Nostock are actually 
um, a delicacy in some countries where people actually like to eat them. Um, but there's also studies that show that Nostoc can cause neurodegenerative disease. Um, there's a toxin called BMAA that researchers are learning more and more about. Um, there's a special food web study that shows that this organism was symbiotically passing toxins up through the food web. And um, I can you know, answer questions about that more later. I won't go into the details of that, but there's a lot of interesting food web studies and we do see Nostoc in some of our lakes, but you know, we're not likely to consume them. Again, the black benthic mat that we have been seeing, we've seen in some of our cleanest lakes, like Lake Winnipesaukee, um, Spofford Lake this last summer for the first time. And it's mainly, I mean, there's a lot of different types of cyanobacteria in these benthic mats and sometimes not all just only cyanobacteria, but other things. Um, but this organism order called Stegonimetales um, is like this branching organism cyanobacteria that will create like a, a rug on the bottom of the lake. It might attach to a rock, um, but they live deeper in the water and they have very low light adaptation, obviously, and they look very black when they surface. Um, we don't know a lot about its toxicity, but we do see it at certain times of year. And now, you know, we also see a lot of things that are not cyanobacteria and it's, it's hard to say, oh, just figure it out and don't, you know, don't call us, please call us. Even if you see something like green filamentous algae, it's something that we are seeing more of and we would like you to report it to DES. Um, but what you can quickly do just to like kind of ease your mind about what you're seeing is the stick test. And it's basically, if you're at the water, find a stick, try to lift up this uh, bloom or scum that you might see. And if it sticks to the stick, um, it's likely a uh, green filamentous algae. It will look kind of like a bundle just under the surface of the water. Um, you, you should be able to lift at least some of it. Um, if it clouds the water, you might be dealing with something else like cyanobacteria. But Green filamentous algae has been associated with some of our cleaner lakes, but um, we are finding that with warmer temperatures and in these sort of warmer shallow embayments, we're finding more of these bundles and people are just as unhappy about it as cyanobacteria. Um, something you might've seen this last summer, especially on the Nashua River, um, is this wolfia bloom. This is also not cyanobacteria, but again, we would, you know, appreciate a call if you saw something like this on any water body because it does look like cyanobacteria. But wolfia is actually a tiny aquatic plant. Um, it's also called water meal. So it's, it's not terrible to see and have in the, in the water. Um, but we're, we did see a lot more of it last summer and it probably had a lot to do with the weather. Um, and then there's euglena and euglena is really not even phytoplankton or a plant really. It's again, it's like this um, like zoid, uh, it's like an animal plant combination. Um, there is its own classification for the euglenas and um, we do see scums of euglena, especially when they are reproducing. And so what we have not seen, to, that to my knowledge, is um, any of these really red euglena. That's the bottom right photo. Euglena do have a red eye spot, but when they make like a pink or a red looking bloom, people are starting to note that they can also produce toxins um, by this particular species of euglena. Again, I haven't seen it that I know of, but again, if you, even if you see the water turning pink or different colors, um, please report it so that we can at least take a look and identify what's going on. Um, this one has recently been identified in other lakes in the Northeast, um, but not New Hampshire, and might be producing something that is toxic to fish. 
So if you do find any sort of strange thing in the water, any of the different colors, scums, blobs, anything that you're concerned about, you should call us. Um, when we issue advisories, we do follow the strict sort of <laughs> policy that's in the New Hampshire code that cyanobacteria advisories are issued when samples are collected, identified, and cell concentrations do exceed 70,000 cells per milliliter. This last year, something that we wanted to adopt for a while, but we really were forced to because of um, restrictions around COVID, um, just that we weren't able to hire enough people to help us in the summer. And we also weren't able to get to as many places as we would like to, um, which in a normal year is hard, but in a COVID year was exceptionally hard. Uh, we decided that we would adopt a cyanobacteria alert system, basically meaning that if someone reported a bloom, we can almost certainly say, okay, people on the lake should know about it, should be on the lookout for it. And so we would share a, an alert locally so that at least people on the lake were aware that there were blooms forming. Um, but it would not become an advisory if we showed up and there, the bloom was gone, which happens all the time, or if um, we, we found the bloom, but it did not exceed 70,000 cells. Um, the reason for that is because um, this stuff doesn't just show up at the beach in high concentrations. It could show up on anybody's shoreline. Um, the wind could move, and then all of a sudden you have very high levels at someone else's house. So alerts are really meant to just let people know about the problem and to be on the lookout. Um, also advisories are pretty much for the same reason. It's just, we've established a, a threshold that is potentially dangerous. So, and we've had cyanobacteria blooms for a lot longer than 2003, but of course that's when we have, you know, the most consistent record of advisories or um, warnings, or alerts, we, we've sort of changed our communication process over the years and we continue to do so um, as the research changes and the communication changes. Um, however, the highest number of advisories have been issued in recent years, um, 34 in 2018, 35 in 2019. And then in 2020, we only had 23 um, but we also issued 35 alerts. So if we saw a photo, we went there uh, the next day, it was gone, seemingly gone, we, we would still let people know to be on the lookout. So that includes just a wide range of conditions that happen. And again, issued if exceeding 70,000 cells, which is a bit arbitrary because every cyanobacteria is different, every cell is different, even those that those that we think are similar might be toxic one day and are not toxic the next day or in the next hour. So it's it's really arbitrary that we use 70,000, but it is based on World Health Organization and um, recommendations and also the Massachusetts Department of Public Health um, did a study indicating that 70,000 would be a good uh, cautionary level to advise for recreational purposes. And a lot of states use 70,000. And so when we look at our advisories um, in New Hampshire from 2003 to current, um, more than 50% have been primarily due to Dilichospermum anabina. Um, this form that you see here on the bottom left is the common form that we see, but there's a lot of different types. And of course, we do have a lot of other blooms that are primarily, you know, one thing or another. Um, it's very likely that most of the blooms have more than one type, but this is just how our um, sort of identification, our communication, and our methods have changed over time. So this really looks at just like the top ones that were reported at the time for, for advisories only. So we really want to focus on Dilichospermum because of how common it is, but there's a good variety here. And so I just point to um, something that the UNH Center for Freshwater Biology has done, and I've been a part of in the past, of course, um, is trying to develop 
taxonomic keys. Um, and one thing that we did put out was a key called the Dirty Dozen. And on there, you might find that this list of cyanobacteria here is very rough because we've, we've grouped some as having you know, a name change for one. Um, another is that some are just similar species with just a slight difference. Um, some are the old name with the new name. Um, so looking at this, this is a very rough list of like the top you know, more common cyanobacteria that we would see in New Hampshire. Um, but looking at like the research and what has been associated with these organisms is that they do produce a wide range of toxins. Again, this is not a complete list here. Um, but microcystin is a word that you might see all the way down this list. And that's because microcystin has been the most well studied. It is also known to be the most commonly produced of the toxins. And this toxin is very stable. So it could cause acute issues, maybe with you know, the digestive system, but more chronically so could be associated with um, like cancer and other um, chronic illness. And so microcystins has been a focal of the research. Um, you know, again, not a complete list here, but BMAA that I mentioned before, um, there's conflicting results in the literature with all of these toxins, really, um, but BMAA probably the most so, and BMAA stands for beta methyl alanine amino acid. It's basically a very tiny molecule that can replace very important amino acids in the brain, like serine. And so BMAA has been, you know, said to be produced by most of the cyanobacteria. And there's also researchers that say that it's really um, not even a toxin to be looking at. So it's, it's um, an emerging science. I will also add that we've been seeing crisis sporum, which is not on the list, not on the dirty dozen. So we do need to maybe update that key a bit. Um, but it has been identified in recent years in some of our lakes, and it's been known to produce anatoxin and cylindrospermopsin as well. And so at DES, we're, we're not always testing for toxins. We're trying to gear that up now. Um, advisories and alerts are not ever based on toxin evaluation. Um, they're intended as a precautionary measure when we do issue those. Um, again, some blooms could be non-toxic, but we've been focused primarily on microcystins. And for those reasons, I just explained that a lot of the cyanobacteria produce microcystins. Um, and so it's a good proxy toxin, but it really, really does not cover everything. So it's hard to say ever that, oh, that bloom was not toxic because we tested for microcystins. There's a lot of other toxins that you should maybe consider. But um, at DES, we, we do have the technology to run ELISA, which is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. There are a lot of kits out there that are sold commercially that we can test for um, a, a range of cyanotoxins. Again, not all of them, but, but a good range of the more um, serious ones, perhaps. Uh, microcystins, again, are are very common. There's nearly a hundred types of different types of microcystin. Um, they're hepatotoxic, so they target the liver, the digestive organs. They can promote tumors. Um, what they what they basically do is they inhibit protein phosphatase. So they they sort of take the place of a normal molecule and inhibit the regular activity of protein building, but acutely can cause upset stomach, gastroenteritis. And, um, you know, so it's, again, it's an important toxin to look at, but it's not everything. But there are health advisory levels that have been set out there by the EPA, uh, microcystins in drinking water for a small child are at the lower level, level of 0.3 parts per billion. And in recreational waters are up at eight parts per billion right now. And so, I mean, this is, a very rough way of looking at the data. But in order to kind of like look at all the samples that we just ran for 2020, um, wanted to show that 
there's a very low rate of toxicity recreationally above two parts per billion from samples that we've tested in New Hampshire. So in 2020, we analyzed 550 something samples related to cyanobacteria complaints. That means we um, looked at them under a microscope, identified them, counted them, um, and you know determined how we were gonna communicate from what we found. Of those, about 45% of the samples that we had we decided we could afford to test for microcystins um, using the ELISA method. And only 19% had positive results at all, but only 3% tested above the test limits, meaning that this, this test maxes out at like two parts per billion or so. Um, that recreational guideline is eight parts per billion. So we tried to um, get these samples within the range of that recreational guideline. And we're finding that some, a few um, exceed our eight parts per billion, but um, not too many. And so again, I wanted just to remind you that this is constantly changing um, due to the wind, the currents, the weather. Like honestly, if you ever report a bloom, it's like, stay there, take a picture, make sure it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> we wanna see this, but it does, it changes so rapidly. The wind blows and you're like, oh, it just went away. But it's really not gone. And on a calm day, you can almost see these like ribbons that represent a timeline of an accumulation. And so toxicity, cell counts, they can all change very rapidly. And what's important about cell counts in this case is that at least we have a sample that represents an identification account and that we can try to correlate with toxicity. Um, but again, there's a lot of complications with toxicity. Like sometimes it can be producing toxins and sometimes it won't. That has a lot to do with the water chemistry, um, lots of factors. Um, but toxicity can also be at the beach, in the sand, as you see, these, um, you know, wind-driven locations are getting, you know, a lot of the material on the shoreline, and that can then leave residual toxin in the sand. Um, so, you know, what should you do if you see a bloom, if you see the water looks a little strange? I mean, there's there's a lot of things you could ignore it, but we would really like it if you took a photo, um, just marked your location and, and let us know. And I can be contacted directly by a, the Cyano hotline with New Hampshire, um, which is 848-8094. Or we also have an email dedicated to harmful algal blooms. Um, that's hab at des.nh.gov. Um, but basically what we're gonna do is just communicate with you on what you're seeing. Um, if we can get out to grab a sample and follow up with you on any sort of findings that we have. Um, if there needs to be an advisory, if there's um, reason to believe that it's something else, we will communicate with you if you ever have any concerns about the water. And so I'll just end with this last slide that is a bit separate from DES, but related. And DES very much supports the work of EPA Region 1, uh, especially Hillary Snook, who has led this um, Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. Uh, you can find the details of this at cyanos.org. Um, with some of our public water systems in New Hampshire, we are trying to get more people on board with being on Bloom Watch, and we hope that everybody, whether it's a public water system, a beach area, you know, anything that even your private pond, that you are on Bloom Watch so that you recognize um, the signs of, uh, you know, water changing color, um, that you recognize scums formation, and at least, you know, keep your dogs out of it. You know, that's really a, a big point of it, but also just, you can just be more aware of what these things look like. So Bloom Watch is basically just, you know, you're at the lake, you you look around, oh, that looks green. I should maybe take a photo and call it in. And that's really all that Bloom Watch is. But it is an app that the EPA has put out trying to get people to report what they're seeing. Um, there's also a component called cyano monitoring, which is more for the well-established volunteer lake associations that 
um, our experience, but also um, have a routine way of, of collecting. In this way, you're collecting water regardless of a bloom, and you're using um, pretty simple tools, um, fluorometry, that can measure the pigments of the water. And um, from a baseline can at least tell you if conditions are looking you know, more colorful than they should without you even realizing. And then finally, cyanoscope, which is kind of what I do in the lab, but basically you could get your own microscope, your own plankton net, and you could create your own monitoring program and try to um, you know, identify things in that plankton net on your own. And again, we have this dirty dozen key. It covers some, but not all. It's, it's a very rough um, example, but it, it's sort of a good start to become more familiar with cyanobacteria under the microscope. And all of these things, all of these volunteer involvement, um, cyanobacteria monitoring initiatives, they kind of overlap, they kind of go together, but you can kind of choose a tiered approach here. Start with Bloom Watch, then maybe notice, oh yeah, we might, we might have a problem. Maybe we should kick it into a different mode of monitoring. But um, with the DES, we are always available if you ever have any sort of concerns, seeing something strange, or if you wish to start your own monitoring um, initiative, um, which is great that you have your association, Acton Wakefield Water Watershed is um, a great association to be in because you guys have the established group, um, you have the, the interest, and um, that can at least help people become more aware of what, what's going on in your lake. Um, so thank you very much. And um, this, again, my contact there. Um, I think I will take questions now and maybe I should stop sharing or maybe I should keep this up, I'm not sure. Yeah, keep it up for now in case people want to write down your information for a bit. And I do just want to briefly add uh, and discuss the, um, the volunteer aspect. So like Amanda said, if, if a lot of like, like associations, um, oh, sorry, I have a little feedback, but um, a lot of like associations in the active like the watershed alliance range are already doing some bacteria monitoring. So you can have a contact power, um, or you can often contact your local like, association and get in touch with people that are already doing monitoring uh, in, your, in your region. Probably, I believe there's some people on this call that, that already do it. So we are, um, we're definitely active in this region, but can always get use more volunteers. Um, so Amanda, I did get a couple of questions in the chat that I wanna throw to you. And I'm just sort of compiling a couple here. Um, several people asked, what the vectors of cyanobacteria are and if they're getting into the lakes via birds or aquatic animals or if it's boats and trailers, is it similar to milfoil in that sense or is it a little different? Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure, yeah, that, that's a good question. It is very different than the invasive species that you're dealing with. Um, but I mean, it's it's it can be introduced by birds and boats, but it doesn't usually take off in an invasive way. Um, the The conditions of the lake have to be set up for the for the right time for it to really take off. Um, so it's it's likely that cyanobacteria are in most of our lakes some capacity. Um, it's just that their ability to kind of grow out of control, and it really doesn't have to do with. Um, it being invasive because it, it really isn't. I mean, there certainly are types of cyanobacteria that are sort of moving northward, uh, you know, north because of maybe climate change. Um, people have sort of questioned certain species if they're if they're invasive, but you should consider it more of the the long history and conditions of the watershed that is likely come to this point of, of selecting for this bloom to happen at that time. And there's just so many factors that really support its growth. It's, it's way beyond like um, a bird bringing it to the lake or, or a boat. It's very different, but still wash your boats because that, that can help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you mentioned phosphorus earlier in your talk as well. So that's one of the big things Awa focuses on is trying to uh, provide outreach about how to ways to reduce external sources of phosphorus from getting into your lakes. That's a big factor. Um, let's see. Okay. Several people also were asking about 
what can be done to prevent the spread. We talked about volunteer opportunities a little bit. There was questions about the impacts of uh, raking your beach and things like that. So I think the overall question is, uh, does DES have recommendations uh, for managing the spread? Uh, obviously, AWA has uh, our own you know, resources or our outreach about phosphorus, but what is DES uh, recommending at this point for managing cyanobacteria blooms? Yeah, at first, just want to say like blooms, blooms do happen. They happen in the cleanest of lakes. So if you have a bloom, I wouldn't automatically um, conclude that it, that something happened, you know, in the watershed that that caused this, and now the lake is ruined. You know, sometimes it's it's lake turnover and a really warm year. You know, um, nutrients from the bottom of the lake that have been accumulating for decades and decades um, can be set up to sort of release more nutrients into the water at certain times and then cyanobacteria grow. And it could just be that it happened once and then it doesn't happen for years. But with lakes that we are finding more and more blooms and more blooms, there are, there are a lot of different remediation methods out there. DES did used to allow like copper sulfate treatment, um, aluminum treatment, um, even aeration. Um, we haven't done that in many years. Um, we are starting to reconsider though. And so there are a few lakes that are going through sort of this like pilot process with DES again, just to reestablish um, what the steps will be to allow certain techniques, um, which techniques will will we consider? Um, but mostly, um, what we're finding is that that um, the lake needs to establish what are the external nutrient issues first. So a watershed management plan is is almost always first recommended um, to identify any external nutrient sources that are excessive. So it doesn't matter how much copper sulfate you put in the lake to like quickly fix the bloom. If you still have a nutrient input problem, blooms are going to keep happening. It's, it's sort of there are these short term solutions out there that might seem OK, but in the long term could be actually creating a more eutrophic lake. So it's almost speeding up the process of the eutrophication of the water. Um, some cases, though, are completely successful and seemingly good for several years. And then, it, you know, a, it's a different weather year. Something changed in the food web. Maybe there was new development and you might have a different scenario. And so what I'll say is that blooms are very unpredictable, but they happen and they happen in the cleanest of lakes. And it is just a, a, like the perfect storm that helps them grow excessively. But overall, yes, watersheds that are more vulnerable to nutrient inputs like phosphorus, um, they might have septic issues. So check your septic, make sure you've addressed any stormwater runoff issues that, you know, you consider the development of the watershed. Over time, all of these things just help support cyanobacteria growth. And it's mostly because cyanobacteria are just so resilient. Um, they can outcompete other algae. Um, they can really live all year round. So it's it's just a, a lot of different factors that set them up. And um, it starts at the watershed. And um, just so our listeners are are familiar with Awa's, one of Awa's programs, we um, have been, we've assisted lakes in, you know, since we began with developing watershed management plans in the area. So currently there are, there is a watershed management plan for the Salmon Falls headwater lakes, which are Great East Lake, Lovell Lake, Horn Pond, and Lake Ivanhoe all together in one plan. There's also a watershed management plan on Province Lake and um, Pine River Pond is currently working with AWA and other local organizations in, in DES. Uh, to develop their own watershed management plan as well. So there are there is a lot of effort, community level effort um, in the area to develop these plans to address stormwater erosion, you know, external phosphorus, septic system replacement, and things like that. Okay, 
let's see, we got it. You, uh, you touched on this. Somebody asked about cyanobacteria during the winter. What does it affect? Do, does freezing have an effect on it? Can you just briefly talk about if it goes away in the winter or persists and, you know, seasonally? Yeah, it, you know, think of cyanobacteria like any of your house plants or, you know, your plants outside. I mean, they really require like the perfect, you know, light situation, nutrient situation and all of that. But again, they're, they're very well adapted. And so they do survive winter, um, but different types, um, you know, over winter in different ways. So um, like, the Delichospermum, for example, you see um, a lot of the, the colony will die, but it will drop its growth cells. And so the growth cells survive the winter in the sediment and then spring comes and then they come up back again. And we're learning more and more that a lot of the cyanobacteria are getting a lot of their nutrients from the sediment. So in the winter, they're probably banking up on a lot of stuff, but then in spring especially is when they tend to take off. You might not see them at the surface for some time, and then they slowly grow and benefit over the summer. But we we do know that like benthic mats, they, they are very slow growing and long lasting. So those aren't usually likely to go away and in an area where they're heavily um, grown. Sometimes a small patch could die out, but um, they're again, low, low light adapted. They can survive cold weather. We even had people report blue green paint coming up from their ice hole, which was cyanobacteria. So they can grow very well under the ice. And there's actually a lot of types that can grow very well in the Arctic lakes. So they're, you know, again, there's just so many different types and they have their different growth requirements and they can survive winter. And uh, touching on that briefly, are there, um, are there pH levels or surface temperature levels that are ideal for blooms? Um, I think you might've just answered that partially, but are, what are some of the water quality or, you know, water characteristics that are ripe for cyano blooms? Yeah, you know, the blooms do like the warmer weather. So that's when cyanobacteria really proliferate in, in, under warming conditions, certainly. So, um, you know, warming temperatures is, is, is one thing, but you, if you look at the, the research, what, there is a lot of research done on like lab cultures of cyanobacteria and how they grow under different um, temperatures. I think that they do, there is a temperature at which they're unhappy. Um, you know, like 30 degrees Celsius is, is something that we are seeing in water. <laughs> and that is, you know, a well-suited temperature for cyanobacteria growth. But once they get caught up at the surface, they, they're actually probably more unhappy baking in the sun and they get kind of caught in the surface tension and then they start to die out. But certainly water temperature is a huge factor and we are, you know, seeing warmer waters. So it, it could end up selecting for more cyanobacteria. Um, but I, you know, I couldn't really put like a, a threshold temperature on it. Um, it's other water quality parameters, really simple ones is water clarity. So if you have a secchi disc, um, you know, that, that can be a good indication that something is changing even if it's not just cyanobacteria, but there's something growing. Um, turbidity, so if all of a sudden, you know, turbidity is a bit higher, that could be an indication of cell growth. Um, pH is an interesting one, and a lot of our lakes are very acidic, so it's hard to really say in New Hampshire, but usually when you have a bloom, you can already see it, so you know it's there, but sometimes that can increase the pH just slightly. It's, you know, maybe a high seven to eight sometimes when there's cyanobacteria growth, but they um, are doing just fine in our acidic waters. Um, so th those are a few uh, I would focus on. Um, even chlorophyll itself, if you, if you routine, routinely are doing chlorophyll extractions, um, even chlorophyll can um, indicate, you know, the eutrophication. Sometimes 
linked to more cyanobacteria growth, but not always, it could be something else growing, but cyanobacteria do have chlorophyll. So it's just another quick way, I guess, especially if you have a uh, fluorometer. Very useful. Um, we had a couple people, I know you, we talked about dogs and, you know, pets and things like that, but would you touch on how cyanobacteria affects fish and wildlife, sort of like the, the natural ecosystem and animal species in the lakes? Yeah, I mean, that that is a good question. There's a lot of very interesting research out there on this. Um, there's some studies that you, even in New Hampshire right now looking at the association of toxins and loons and how it makes its way up the food web. Um, some of my own research I focused on was how cyanotoxins move through the food web. So I think that we have a lot to learn on the biomagnification of certain toxins and, and what it is really doing. Um, but more acutely, really, is that the, the blooms um, create oxygen, but when they start to grow prolifically and then they're scummy at the surface, they start to die and the oxygen in the water changes. So that is very sensitive for a lot of aquatic life, like fish. Um, there are lots of studies that show a toxin accumulation that could um, affect certain species of fish and not others. There's also a lot of evidence that um, benthic organisms or anything that is a filter feeder at the bottom of the lake probably has the highest load of toxin you could find in the whole lake. So you know, definitely don't find it novel or fun to eat freshwater mussels or, or, or snails from the lakes because they likely have a, a very high load of toxin, but they're not necessarily dying. Um, they can die though, but again, it might be more, more likely due to oxygen changes. However, there are studies that show that toxins themselves do cause like lethargy in organisms, like they're just slower and um, just not as quick. Um, basically uh, accumulate toxins and, and the implications to move up the food web is, is highly questionable. Um, but there's a lot of studies on these higher predator organisms um, like um, uh, bald eagles, just some sort of the, like more raptor type organisms of a lake that will feed from a lake and have experienced neurological issues. Lots of studies on that. Um, I would be happy to share more about that if anyone had questions, but it's all over the board. Research on cyanobacteria is just very wide and um, sort of just lots of different results out there. As many studies as you find that it affected something, as just as many will say, oh, no, it's not a problem. Hmm. Sounds like it's still a relatively new area of research and lots is lot, lots still coming out on it. Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone has more questions for Amanda, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll try to get a few more in. Um, I actually had a question for myself. I noticed in your presentation that spirulina was a species on the dirty dozen, and I recognized that as sort of a trendy uh, food supplement and found in cocktails and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Are people eating and drinking cyanobacteria when they purchase spirulina in the health food section of the grocery store? What's <laughs> do you know anything about yeah, that? Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know. <laughs> We have to assume, I guess, that it's not a highly toxic strain, um, but the, the, the reality is that they're not doing, it's not FDA approved if it, if it is, um, that's new to me. Spirulina has been used for a long time. It's very popular right now. Um, you might ask, you know, pay a few dollars for it in your smoothie. It, it is a pure culture of dried cyanobacteria. Um, Spirulina is something that we do find in some of our lakes and can produce microcystins at least. Um, but the more I look on the shelf, the more I'm like, wow, I just spirulina or they'll say it's blue green algae or they'll say, um, oh, aphanizomenon is, is another one. Um, 
I, it's something that you should probably not take every day, but acutely would probably be fine. But chronically, I would be concerned about, and I would probably, you know, avoid that. Um, avoid taking it every day. Um, but you know, I I don't know enough about the long term effects, but there are some studies that show that the chronic exposure can cause like liver cancer or neurological disease down the road. I think it's risky, but there are health benefits. There's chlorophyll, of course, it's, you know, it has the chlorophyll benefits, um, but I think the risk of toxicity is still there. Um, just a side note, like we did test some products at UNH. We looked at it under the microscope, we tested it, and we did find a lot of the products at least tested positive for toxins. Um, and also some of those like kombucha drinks out there that add stuff to, there's like a variety of kombucha. Kombucha is great, but there's certain brands that add um, cyanobacteria to them. And we looked at that under the microscope and it was a lot more than cyanobacteria in there. It was um, like zooplankton body part, like little arms and legs. And just hot. it was like someone took a plankton net and threw it in the bottle mixed it with kombucha and said, this is going to be the best. And, and that also tested for toxins at, you know, at UNH, when I was there, we tested for these things. Again, I don't know for certain on all of the stuff, but it's really, it's in so many things I could go on and on, like coloring and ice cream, like in prenatal vitamins. It's just astonishing, really. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. So That's maybe, enough. um, Play it safe. Keep it out of your legs and your cocktails. It's good I to think. So. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Let me just see here if there's any last minute questions. Um, um, I guess the last thing, if you have a couple more minutes, the last question I wanted to just clarify for the listeners is. Um, so people are concerned about green filamentous algae and other species that are also native, but kind of a nuisance species like cyanobacteria. So are there any, um, and they, they tend to get conflated together as, as the same kind of issue, but are, do we have the same kind of uh, health concerns or even environmental concerns from things like filamentous algae, or is that more simply a, a nuisance from a, a like a recreational perspective it is it's it's more it's just a slimy unsightly gross thing it, and it can really take over um like an embayment it can all of a sudden like just be in your swim location and be really annoying mm -hmm. but it's not it's not known to be toxic it can sometimes contain other things that are not great for you like cyanobacteria or like parasites it, it's like a, a rolling tumbleweed in the water it picks up a lot of different things, but it's mostly made of green filamentous algae. And that in itself is actually probably great for composting, um, great for your gardens. Um, you know, if you can spot it early, it's best to try to just remove it rather than um, wait until it gets really bad. So physical removal is recommended. Um, you just, you know, you might want to call us to make sure that you know that it's green filamentous algae, of course, um, before you compost it. But it's it's definitely a sign of, of climate change, but it's also an organism that's associated with cleaner water. So it's, it's conflicting because warmer waters it loves, but it's also growing just fine in clean water. And so I think it's more of the warming temperatures that are, we're gonna see more of it. And then it kind of all like goes into a cove like cyanobacteria would. Um, but even still, there's some studies that, that have shown that that stuff is good for um, preventing cancer. It's, it's just really amazing all of the research that's out there. So I would say mostly green filamentous algae, we want you to report it because we are seeing more of it and we think it's because of temperature, but it's not necessarily a toxic um, organism to handle. Um, there are, again, benthic mats though that come up from the surface, I mean, from the bottom to the surface that could be potentially very toxic. So understanding and knowing the difference is important. Okay. 
Um, and somebody did finally just ask the million dollar question uh, that I wanted to run by you. Should we be concerned when our children and grandchildren are swimming? How far away should humans stay from cyanobacteria? What are the direct, I, I, you did touch on this briefly, but I guess you know what people want to know is what level of concern and safety should they actually exercise around these cyano blooms, especially regarding children, I guess, or vulnerable people. Yeah, I mean, I always say if you can see it, you should avoid contact. Um, you certainly keep your pets and kids out. You you might be fine going in and, and like not drinking or swallowing the water. Um, but some people get um, a rash. Just, you know, a lot of times when I sample, my forearm is always rashy in the summer, but I'm very sensitive to that stuff. Like I'm allergic to nickel. So it, it really um, varies by the person. Um, most definitely keep your dogs out because they just can't help themselves. Um, if you do think that you've got it on your skin, just rinse off, um, really. But you just want to avoid swallowing too much of it. And if you can see it, it's probably at levels that are high, but not always toxic. So the risk um, is unknown. It's, it's really just best to avoid contact. If you see it, report what you're seeing. So we can really understand what's going on as well, um, but it's always best to keep your your pets out of anything that looks like this because it could be, it could be fatal. Okay, well that's uh, very stark and honest uh, input right there. I think that it is better to exercise caution, obviously. So hopefully that answers that question for everybody. Um, that's pretty much it on the, the questions. Obviously, I didn't get to all of them, um, and I so it sort of lumped some together. So if anybody does have specific questions that they want to run by either Amanda or myself, um, I would be, you know, I would encourage you to email Amanda directly at the contact information she left up on the screen. You can also um, email Awa. Uh, I put my email in the chat, but um, you can also go to Awa's website or go to the DES website for any of our contact information. So thank you very much to everybody. I uh, really appreciate your time, Amanda. I'm glad that you could speak in an evening and I'm glad that everybody here could join us in the evening. Um, so thank you very much again for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. And I'll take any questions, just email or call me or text me. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. We're connected.